privilege to be here uh, with the secretary. I, I want to just say a few words about his background because he has a, a, a lifetime history of standing up for working people. So let me just say, just tell you a couple things about uh, Thomas Perez, if you don't know about his history. He previously served as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice, which is the department that enforces federal laws that prohibit discrimination and upholds the civil rights and constitutional rights of everyone in America. During his tenure, he oversaw the effort to restore and expand the division's achievements. He successfully implemented the uh, Hate Crimes Prevention Act. He worked to expand equal housing uh, opportunities by actually Actually, bringing and settling the largest fair lending, uh, some of the largest fair lending cases in history. He worked on preventing school children from discrimination and bullying and harassment. And he is just in his short tenure. Uh, as the Secretary of Labor, he has been such a strong voice, he's been one of the strongest voices that this country has seen in recent years to stand up for working people. So we're very happy to join with him on the Cleveland leg of his world tour, national tour. <laughs> So, so let's give him a great Cleveland record uh, welcome and show him how we respect the work that's being done here. Secretary of Labor, Thomas Perez. Thank you so much, Mr. County Executive. Thanks, great Appreciate to be it. here. Sure. Thank you so much, and Jill, thank you so much. And I couldn't agree more. Our best speaker is right to my left. I just saw a photo of her grandchild on her phone, and that's what she lives for, to serve others. It's an honor to be here in Cleveland. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. I love Lake Erie. This is a balmy day. It's a balmy day here on the Great Lakes, the great city by a great lake. I love Cleveland. It's great to be here. It's great to be here to talk about opportunity because that's really what we're talking about. That's what the president's talking about. He is all about expanding opportunity for everyone. And opportunity has really four pillars. Opportunity is about making sure we do more to create good jobs that pay a good wage. And by the way, I'll note, um, you know, in Toledo, I was reading the story about the Jeep uh, plant there. You know, the one that Mitt Romney said was going to China? Well, they're working 60 hours a week there now. They're working so hard that they're going to add up to 1,000 new workers in that Jeep plant. Insourcing. And you know what? Something like 15% of those cars being produced are being sent overseas for sale. Uh, that's America that this president is building, creating good jobs, 48 consecutive months of private sector job growth to the tune of 8.7 million jobs. We have to do more, but we're moving in the right direction. Second pillar of opportunity, making sure everybody has access to the skills necessary to do those jobs. And that's why we do so much at the Department of Labor to make sure everybody has those opportunities. The third pillar is making sure that wonderful young women like you who brave the elements to be here today have access to a world-class education. Thank you for coming here today. You've got a good family. They're bringing you here, teaching you about making sure your voice is heard. This is called civics. And civics is about making sure at a grassroots level you make your voices heard to your elected officials. That's how change happens. Change doesn't initiate in Washington. Change comes to Washington. And change comes to Washington from Cleveland, comes from Columbus, comes from Cincinnati, comes from all over Ohio and the country. So thank you. And that fourth pillar of opportunity is to make sure we reward work with a fair wage. Nobody who works a full-time job in this country should have to live in poverty. Nobody. And yet you hear the story of Tracy working as many hours as she can, working as many jobs as she can find. I talk to so many people across this country who are making choices between a gallon of milk or a gallon of gas, making choices between whether they buy food or whether they buy medicine, all because they're not making enough all because the purchasing power of the minimum wage is 20% less than it was 30 years ago. Imagine if you work any job in America and you're told, I want you to take a 20% pay cut from when Ronald Reagan was president. 20%, you know, your, your food isn't going down. Your housing costs aren't going down. Cost of living ain't going down. And that's what's happened to so many workers across this country. And you know what? I want to tell you, Tracy, you do God's work, taking care of folks in a home health setting. And I want to thank my friends and colleagues 
at SEIU at AFSCME who have worked so hard to advocate on behalf of home health workers. And I was so proud as the Labor Secretary. There are two million home health workers in this country. And you know, I met one in Delaware who was a former home health worker. She went to work at McDonald's instead because she couldn't make ends meet, because there was a loophole in the wage and hour laws, and they weren't even entitled to get the minimum wage. And so I met people working 80 hours a week, making $350, do the math. That's terrible. You can't live in that. And so we closed that loophole and made sure that everybody who's working in the home health industry can have access to the minimum wage and overtime protections because you are doing God's work. And I want to thank you for that. <laughs> Americans need a raise. That's the, that is the bottom line. And there are over a million Ohioans who will benefit from an increase in the minimum wage. This will funnel literally a billion dollars into the Ohio economy right now. You know, I meet so many minimum wage workers who tell me, Tom, I do not want to be on food stamps. I want to be self-sufficient. But I can't because I'm working hard and falling further behind. And you know, there was a recent study that said, if you want to reduce the ranks of the food stamp recipients by over three million, if you want to save $4.6 billion a year, then raise the minimum wage. $46 billion savings over 10 years if we just raise the minimum wage. We are subsidizing the business models of all too many industries in this country. Some of them you're well aware of, you know, the fast food industry. But others you may not be aware of. Did you know that 30% of bank tellers are on some form of public assistance? There's a $900 million a year subsidy to the banking industry because tellers all too frequently need to rely on public assistance. $900 million a year. That's not America. We want to reward hard work with a fair wage. That's what Congress said 75 years ago when they passed the Fair Labor Standards Act. And that's what Congress, in an overwhelming bipartisan way over the course of decades, has said when they have raised the minimum wage. I worked for a senator named Ted Kennedy for a number of years. You may know him. And I was proud of his work on behalf of working families. And most recently, I was with a senator who reminds me of Senator Kennedy, and that's a guy named Sherrod Brown. We were in Columbus at a restaurant called the Brothers Drake, because you know, I hear frequently that if you raise the minimum wage, it's gonna hurt businesses. Well, this was a small business owner in Columbus doing great stuff. And he understands that you don't have to make a choice between your workers and your business model. You can take care of your workers and make a good living. You can do good and you can do well. You go to Costco. They have debunked the notion that it's a, you have to choose between your shareholders and your workers. You know what? If you bought $1,000 of Costco stock 14 years ago, $1,000 worth, you know what it would be worth today? It'd be worth $14,500. That's a 17% annual rate of return. They call me Tom, buy high, sell low, Perez. I didn't get that stock. <laughs> but I've met the CEO of Costco, and they understand that their workers are their most precious resource. The Costco employees, they're making $15, $20 an hour and more. The people who are the general managers of those stores, they started out pushing carts and worked their way up. I've spoken to the CEO of Shake Shack, which is a wonderful burger joint. I had lunch with him last Friday. I don't have lunch with him very often because the burgers are too good and the shakes are even better. And I'm trying to stay in shape. I don't want it to become Shape Shack. But you know what? Every one of his workers makes a fair wage. At the end of every month, they get a bonus based on their performance. So you know what, if, whether it's the big box retail model, whether it's the small restaurant in Columbus, whether it's the Ace Hardware store a half a mile from my office, whose owner pays above the minimum wage because you know why? She has a loyal workforce, she has less attrition, she has more efficiency, she has everything that Henry Ford had 
when a hundred years ago, he doubled the wages of workers on the assembly line. He did that because he had over 300% attrition. And he did that because he understood that, you know what? When you put money in people's pockets, when people can afford to buy the products you're making, they're gonna spend that money. And you know what Tracy's gonna do when the minimum wage gets increased? And you'll notice, I said when. This is not an if question, ladies and gentlemen. This is a when question. You know what she's gonna do? Well, I'll tell you, I'll predict what she's not gonna do. She's not gonna open up an offshore bank account and put her money there. She's gonna buy a present for her grandchild. She might even get a chance to treat herself to a restaurant once in a while. She will get to buy medicine. She will invest in our communities. And that is why when we put money in people's pockets, we stimulate the economy. Business owner after business owner tells me, I support a minimum wage in part because I need more customers. And when we put money in people's pockets, we have more customers. When we stimulate the economy and we grow our economy. And so that's what we have to do. That's why it's time for Americans to get a raise. And I wanna say thank you to all of you who are here today. Thank you, Tracy, for giving voice to this wonderful issue. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Thank you to all of you. This started out as a brush fire. Went into a prairie fire. It's a wildfire of access to fairness. That's what we're seeing across this country. I've met with mayors across this country, county executives across this country, governors across this country. You see the state of Connecticut. This bus was in Connecticut the day Connecticut raised the minimum wage. Just three days ago, 1010, Dan Malloy, call him up. Tell him, good job, governor. Thank you for standing up for working families. And this prairie fire is going across America. And when you have people like Senator Brown and others saying, give America a raise, it can be done. And I know there's sometimes some pessimism. How do you get things done in Washington? Well, I'll tell you. I mentioned before and I'll mention again, I worked for a guy named Senator Kennedy. Back in 90, 1996, Newt Gingrich thought it was a good idea to shut down the federal government. It was a terrible idea. And in the aftermath, people were angry. And people said, you can't get anything done in Washington. In 96 was a presidential election year. You never get anything done in a presidential election year. Well, what happened that year? We passed immigration reform. We passed an increase in the minimum wage, welfare reform, a hate crimes bill, health reform, all in 1996 because the people demanded it. And that's what we're doing today. We cannot make progress without your voice being heard here in Cleveland, down in Columbus, over in Cincinnati, over in Toledo across America. That's what we're going to do because Americans need a raise and Americans will get a raise. It's good for business, it's good for workers, it's good for America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it.